a műsor támogatói. Az On The Spot stábjának munkáját a Szerencsejáték ZRT támogatja. Hogy a nagy tervek megvalósuljanak, ezért vagyunk itt. A műsor támogatója az Unicredit Bank. Az On The Spot előző évada a születésről szólt, szerte a világban. Arra voltunk kíváncsiak, hogy milyen hatással vannak a születésünk körülményei az életünkre. Közben pedig mi magunk is szülőkké váltunk. Most azért utazzuk körbe a világot már hármasban, hogy megtudjuk, vajon hogyan dolgozhatjuk föl legmélyebb gyerekkori traumáinkat. Olyan embereket kerestünk, akiknek nehezebben indult az életük, mint másoknak. Akik a 20. század legsötétebb pillanataiban jöttek a világra. Rosszkor voltak rossz helyen, amikor megszülettek. Ők voltak az ellenség gyermekei. Észak-Koreában, Vietnámban, Kambodzsában, Boszniában, vagy éppen Magyarországon. A szüleiket elhurcolták, kitelepítették, bebörtönözték, vagy meggyilkolták. A filmekből kiderül, hogy ezek a gyerekek hogyan maradtak életben, majd felnőttként mihez kezdtek a traumáikkal, és a csodával, hogy túlélték. Vietnámi háború 20 évig tartott, és több mint 3 millió ember életét követelte. A halottak közül 2 millió civil volt. Az amerikai csapatok fél időben, 1965-ben kezdtek harcolni a Vietkongok ellen. A következő 10 évben pedig több mint 2,5 millió amerikai katona állomásozott Vietnámban. Közülük csak nem 60 ezeren estek el az Egyesült Államok egyik leghosszabb ideig tartó és legmegosztóbb háborújában. Dél-Vietnámban a harcok zajától távol, becslések szerint közel 50 ezer gyerek született amerikai katonáktól. Ők az úgynevezett amerázsiaiak. A háború végére nyilvánvalóvá vált, hogy az amerázsiaiakat az ellenség gyermekeinek tekintik majd, ezért sokukat árvaházba adták. Mire véget ért a háború, összesen 70 ezer gyerek maradt árván Vietnámban. The Ford administration announces Operation Baby Lift, a humanitarian effort to rescue Vietnamese orphans. In Saigon, Ambassador Graham Martin reportedly calls it marvelous propaganda, which could be useful to persuade a reluctant Congress to vote more arms money to keep the war going. These 2,000 Vietnamese orphans, orphans are all in the process of being adopted by American families. This is the least we can do and we will do much, much more. We are referred to as the golden children because there's so few of us. If I wasn't adopted, what would I be doing now? You know, my legs would be all contracted. I'd probably be, you know, sliding around on a board or, or on one of those bikes that push back and forth, selling um, um, lottery tickets. We were raised in a very rural, white American um, area of the U.S. I knew I was Asian, but I acted and hung out everything white, American. It's like winning the lottery. It really is, because you look now, and just in the five years I've been here, how different crazy it was 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So I'm very lucky. How did you guys all meet? Some reunions, right? I remember, remember I met you a long, long time, maybe 2002 or three or four-ish. Here? 
in Vietnam. Yeah, we went to a couple of bars or clubs that night. Yeah. They said you hadn't been home for four years or something like that, you said? Yeah, back in Ohio, it's been almost five years. Yeah. It has it's been five years. already. Yeah. Oh, wow. Are you going to go see your family when you're home? Or? I'm not going to have time to go all the way back to Ohio. Really? It's, 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 a, it's a haul. It's like, it feels like a second haul from It's like halfway point. There's another four hour flight. They may not see you? Or? No, yeah. Really? Fuckers. The only thing it is is that, you know, my parents are <laughs> My parents are the same amazing. way. Yeah. Really? They have no desire. My parents have never come. I've been 15 years, never come out to yeah. see me. That frustrates me because I, I fly home every year. Every year, Because wow. I, I, I got nephews and nieces, you yeah, know, yeah. maybe you do too, but I, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to see them. I want to see them. Uh, yeah, I met, yeah. Yeah. Getting married in December, so my mom is right here, so, you know. You know this is your? Biological mother. Oh. Yeah. And this is my fiance. Landon, do you know someone who, who shares a similar story like Tui that found both parents or? Nope. Nope. <clears throat> nope. No one. It's rare. Yeah. And then to, to be this close to your, to, to your, your mother is not even heard of. Well, I know my story is, is, is rare. So, uh, but I mean, I, I, I try not to make anyone feel bad about it in that way. In like a jealousy way. Mm -hmm. In Vietnam, they say that uh, each person has a different number. Some people are that much more lucky than others. My mom was a single woman back then. You know, a single mom. My father had gone back to the Philippines. She had my sister, was taking care of my sister. When I was born, she said I was very strong, but uh, she got sick. Mom actually brought me to the orphanage. It wasn't really the orphanage in the countryside, it's the church. Uh, she was going to drop me off for three years and then come back and pick me up, which she did. But during that time, I ended up getting polio and got sick. And because of lack of records and whatnot, they didn't know who my family was. And so then they sent me up to Saigon for medical reasons. And then during the time in Saigon, um, I was then adopted uh, to a family in America. My father in America is an opera singer, where my mom, she's a lawyer. She works with a lot of charities. She uh, came over to uh, Cambodia during the 80s, you know, and was in the refugee camps. There was a whole movement of peace walks that were happening in Russia, and she was part of that. And that's how it sort of transitioned over to the peace walk in the 90s here in Vietnam. <laughs> One of the ways of helping is there are byproducts of the war, and one of the byproducts of the war is orphans. By the time I was born, it wasn't, that had nothing to do with it. He came over to uh, Vietnam in 1968 because my father was a principal at a school at the time, and he, he was doing logging. He wanted to look at logging prospects in Vietnam during the war, but then when he was in Vung Tau, he ended up getting picked up by the U.S. Army as uh, one of those radio uh, receivers. My mom, during that time uh, in Vung Tau, she had come up when she was really young, and she would basically walk in front of where my father ended up working, going to the market every day. Supposedly, my father left uh, in January of 1970. She couldn't even write a letter to my dad even though he, she had his address and he never wrote her. I mean, because uh, my dad had a family prior, so my mom is the same, same age as my si oldest sister in the Philippines, so. You know, I didn't think I would ever find her, honestly. I mean, million to one, you know, whatever. You know, I was, what, 23 years old? Kind of messing up in college. But I wanted to at least go back to Sadek and give the nuns some money and thank them for taking care of me as a kid. We went to the orphanage and we basically stopped traffic. Everybody stopped what they're doing. The whole city came up. They were like standing around. We're in the courtyard. One of the ladies that was older than me, not by much, she was the girl that took care of me when I was there. But that morning she ended up coming in, into town to see a relative that, be, uh, that was in the hospital and she always drops by the church to see how the nuns were doing. And so she was like, um, when she put two and two together, she oh yeah, I know where your mom is. I'll be back, she's in the rice fields, I'll be back in a little bit. 
the town was completely full. I'm sitting in the middle courtyard. I'm surrounded by Vietnamese, hundreds of them. And then all of a sudden, there's this little commotion, kind of like, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, you know, hands flying off and, you know, things like that. And then she pops out. And she, like, walked over to me. Uh, she just walked over to me and grabbed me by my head, right? And I had that, that, that scar, oh, yeah. right? Saw it and basically hit me on the arm and, and uh, smiled and told uh, the crowd that this is my son. I don't know if you've ever gotten mad and you feel like your head is bubbling you know, like, like fizzing. Like, I totally felt like that. The first time I went to Vietnam, I got on a plane from Chicago, and as I was flying over, I saw a sea of black hair on the plane. And that was just a big shocker. A sea of black hair in front of me, I'm like, wow, this is really gonna be something. I you know I dreamed about what it would be like landing in Vietnam. Can't wait to get to see the city come in. Oh, I'm coming in at 11.30 at night. I'm not gonna see anything. I even got a window seat, I was so pumped. Get there, I'm like, I missed everything. So when I woke up the next morning, I literally opened this door, very noisy, squeaky, rusty old door. Opened it up to the middle of nowhere and the world came alive. I was like, this is a life that, like literally I felt like I just landed on this planet, was put here, and all of a sudden I can see everything, live. So whatever I dreamed about and thought about and saw pictures and videos growing up, now it's live. Why did I come back to Vietnam? A part of me growing up was like, you know, I wasn't born in America, and um, I wanted to learn about the other half. You know, growing up, and all my friends around me were like, Hey, this is the hospital I was born at. These are my grandparents, blah, 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 blah. And I never had a connection with that. It was just a geographical thing for me. And so I always thought something was pulling me towards coming back to where my was actually started. So I just basically jumped on a plane with a friend of mine and came to Vietnam and fell in love with it eight years ago. Back home in America, it's very repetitious. It's very nine to five, weekends off, holidays off. Did you have that life before you moved? I did, yeah. Nine to five, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Kids. Oh, no, no kids. No kids. Okay. Were you looking for some things from your past when you first came here? Or? No, it's just, it's almost impossible. The background of my story was that my mother had me. I was born in Bung Tao in 1973. And being a mixed baby back then was a no-no. She was a little bit older. She was in her you know, early 30s. She actually left the hospital at that point and uh, left me there. And then the nurses took me to an orphanage there locally in Bung Tao. And I stayed there for a year. In the process of that time, my parents, my adopted parents in America, were doing the paperwork for me to come to America. That took about probably six to seven months. So in the time of that frame, the ladies at the orphanage would write to my mother in America about my progression of growing up, you know, progress of getting, you know, my first haircut, my first teeth, and my personality, how I behaved, yeah. Where is Wung Tao? Wung Tao is about two and a half hour car ride from Saigon to the coast. At that time period, it was a spot for a lot of the uh, military guys during the war to relax and R&R. &R. And um, a lot of mixed babies came out of Wung Tao, believe it or not. My dad, I know nothing. They say back in the day it was probably either an American soldier or maybe an Australian soldier or a Russian soldier. The father would probably have no clue that I was conceived. And opening up Pandora's box at my age is not something I'm really interested in doing. I'm good with who I am. I don't have a burning desire to find myself and find my birth parents and find my brothers and sisters. My mother in America couldn't conceive. Your mom never been to Vietnam? Never been. It was like, okay, there is one baby who's one month old or whatever, and then... No, it's basically like picking out of a magazine, I think. They basically went through a magazine and said, we'll take this one. There were That's photos fair. and magazines of Vietnamese orphans. I don't know. It's kind of the running joke. 
I don't want to say that. I don't think it's true, but I don't think I don't know how how I was picked. I don't know how I, the number, the random, this and that. Mm. You know, in my my mind, I picture that. Can you tell me about your adoptive family or your family now? My adoptive family? Mm -hmm. Crazy, um, dysfunctional, like probably most families are. All of us have our own individual personalities and uh, bloodline are different, you know. Uh, but we're all raised together, you know. Growing up with an abusive father, uh, verbally abusive, physically abusive, being pulled out of the home, bringing back in the home, you know, it changes everybody's life. You know, for me and for my, my family, my, my siblings, you know, naturally as a child, you, you blame yourself. Uh, but as you get older, you forgive, you learn, you understand, you forget. So, yeah, you know, it's, it wasn't the Brady. It wasn't the Brady bunch. You know, we we had our ups and downs. We had our, you know, our, our problems like any other family. Nothing's perfect. And your mom? But she's just an innocent bystander, just trying to raise six kids, doing the best she could. Love her to death. Proud of her. Um, but you know, what is she doing now? They're retired. They're both retired. Living in Florida, living out their, 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 their final years, you know, retirement, enjoying it, beach and cruises. Everybody's doing their thing in their life. I'm the only one that actually came back and moved back abroad. Living abroad in another country that I was born. So, if you asked me five years ago, I'd be living here five years later, I'd say, I don't know. And here we go, we're five years into it. When I first got here, I really felt and liked being me because I was finally just someone in the crowd. I wasn't always easy to pick out. You know, I wasn't the Asian in the white crowd. I was, I was just another Asian in the whole midst of it, and I could be anonymous. that money from a $2 million special foreign aid children's fund be made available to fly 2,000 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States as soon as possible. Okay, bye-bye. Everything's okay. okay. I'm okay. The airlift of orphans out of South Vietnam is underway again following yesterday's tragic crash, which killed more than 140 orphans on the first flight. They were still searching the wreckage of the C-5 Galaxy 20 hours after the crash, looking for more bodies. When the plane impacted, most of the bottom half were sheared off. Those in the bottom deck, with few exceptions, were killed. About 100 of the 234 orphans survived the crash. They were battered, bruised, and cut. The significance of the crash site, the significance of this experience, doesn't impact me emotionally as much as other people, other adoptees have. 
Um, there, like I, Rose, I just most recently heard there's some adoptees that came over. One was on the plane crashing and survived, and we, we hung out and stuff like that, and they went out to the crash site just at, during that time, and they said it's getting bulldozed. It's owned by just some, you know, some, some, some Vietnamese, and now they plan to, I think, either build, you know, build on it or do something, and they were quite distraught about it. Like, oh, I can't believe we should buy the, try to buy the land, or we should see if we can get a monument put up so that way they can't you know, bulldoze it down or whatever, and I'm like, it's their land, Jesus Christ. They can do whatever they want with it. I don't have any of those type of emotional connections with those type of things. I mean, we don't even know our actual birth date because documentation was destroyed when, it, when the plane crashed. Most likely I'm a twin. I mean, Laura, my sister, and I have never done a DNA test together, so we actually haven't proven that we are twins, you know, like by blood. I mean, it's probably easy to do. Well, it's easy to do now, but I have, we haven't done it. It might be funny, though, if we weren't actually twin, we weren't related, and we thought we were this whole time. <laughs> um, do you look similar? We do look similar, though. Everybody says we look similar. We act similar, too. So, My biological mother um, died during child, childbirth, giving you know, birth to twins. They say that my dad was a, a doctor. Um, I've heard some, some of it. Maybe he was a doctor in, in, the, in the South Vietnamese Army. Um, for some reason, maybe he didn't have family or didn't want the, his children to be raised with his family. I think it was the 25th anniversary of um, the fall or the liberation of Saigon, so April 30th. And I watched on, that, on I think it was Discovery Channel, and I watched a show of a woman who, a Vietnamese woman who, you know, who, I don't know if she was adopted or if it was her whole family, but it's focused on her mainly. They had gone back with her, a film crew had gone back, or at least had some film of her and her experience of Vietnam, and I'm like, I have to do that. It's time for me to do it. And it really, I, I really it, it was that hard. And I literally quit my job and got a ticket. I was out within a month. There you go. When I first came back to Vietnam eight years ago, I walked on the streets of Mung Tao and I said, you know, I could have passed my month on the street. Uh, but it's so far now that with life and Everything else, it gets, it gets, that gets, you know, that gets outstaged, I think, and, you know, yeah, yes, I, mean, I don't want to, I have, I've met some of the other adoptees that revolve their whole life around finding their parents. I think part of it could be a little bit that I just don't have any, I don't have much information, I have very little, so there is really no place to go on, you know, yeah. so that's par partially why, maybe, for me. But it's kind of hard to live your life with what ifs. It's no, exactly. My mom hand me a shoebox. When I was 25 years old, she goes, here you go, son. I'm like, mom, what's this? And I opened up and there was a suit in there and a jacket and shoes that she had mailed to me to Vietnam for me to wear on the plane to come into America that I had not seen for 25 years. Then all of a sudden she hands me a stack of envelopes from all the nurses that had wrote back to America. And I'm like, mom, 25 years later, are you kidding me? I had no idea about this stuff. Then she hands me a letter and she says, here, they're having a reunion. You came from whole international and they're having a reunion in Baltimore and you can, you're more than welcome to go or not. So that's how much out of the dark I was. I'm like, I had no idea for how many years, even what organization I came through. So it was like, bam, in my lap. Then I go to the reunion, bam, in my lap. Landon, you grew up in a religious family. Yes. And Mormon? now? Yeah, I'm Mormon. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. That is pretty strong. There's no part, there's no part known as Mormon. It's either you are or you aren't, right? Yeah. I find the religion, this is more like religion in general, is a very shaming and a very guilt type uh, type society, you know, where you, <coughs> where you just, yeah, exactly. So, it is a cult. <laughs> and, I want, and I don't like to, I don't like those feelings, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they guilt you in, you know, what you're into believing these, you know, these things. You know, like, that's not for me. I don't want to feel guilt. I don't want to feel shame. God doesn't love us for just an hour or two once a week. So if church exists to help us feel closer to Him, it needs to be bigger than a Sunday service. What if believers didn't just form a congregation? What if they formed an extended family of faith? When I talk about like religion, Mormon religion, and how I grew up in it, and then how I left it with my friends all the time, because they think it's hilarious that I was raised Mormon because I act completely not Mormon now. The Mormons are very very communi community oriented. So all the Mormons always hang out together. You know, it's not, it's not just a Sunday thing, okay? First of all, you go to church for three hours on Sunday. That's like forever long. I tried to hold on a bit longer just because I thought that, you know, there was, I mean, it was really mainly guilt and fear. 
that I, that I held on was more, nothing more. It was the idea, well, what if I am wrong and I'm, I'm doomed to hell? And that's what the Mormons do teach. And do you remember what happened when you left? Like, what, what was the last drop or like what was, or was it slowly building up? Slowly building up. I think I just one day, I don't remember specifically a time or a moment, I just remember letting go of that fear or that shame that I was gonna, that I was supposed to feel. And then were you ever close to marrying a Mormon girl and living like a, a life which was ex expected from you, from the community? Yes, I did. You did? Yeah, I was married to a Mormon girl and then I divorced. Ah, really? Yeah. And I was supposed to do that, yep. Yep. And how was that? It didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> how old were you when you got married? About, I think, 25, and then divorced at 27. Just a couple, you didn't last long at all. All my friends were getting married at the time, you know, within, you know, two, two years before, around then. So I was kind of like, whoa, they're getting married and they're settling down, you know, and, you know, as part of not just the Mormons, you know, expecting that. But it, that's kind of like the Ameri you know, supposedly the American dream, you know, yeah. You, you, gradu you, you go to university, you graduate, you get a job, you get, you, you know, you get, you get married, you have a family, you buy a house, and that's the dream. That's definitely not the dream. Not for me. I do remember the days when I thought I'm gonna change one day. Now I know that I was wrong, I'm still the same. The same old home I used to be, I'm still my major enemy. But at the all I know that I'm not gonna change one day. I am a big believer that things happen for a reason in life, and especially with my life. A lot of things have connected and, and come about and run into people and small world type things. And um, stumbling across back fighting two again. Um, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook changed What do you mean again? Me. Like you guys met in Baltimore first time? We met in Baltimore. Time? We were like two that peas in a pod. That life-changing meeting? Yeah. yeah. And then we, I went back got married. He went on with his life. He went back and found his family. <laughs> Totally, so, yeah. I, it was just I was like totally, and we couldn't that. get in contact with him. I had a phone number. That's the only way I could get a hold of him. And the number only worked in America when he was here. I didn't realize he had gone back to Vietnam. Then a guy found me on Facebook from the reunion, Tim Holden. And that's where everything had changed. That, from that point on, in February, I started, people started friending me, I started friending them, and I connected only with the people that I had met from the reunion. And one of them was too. I, I typed him in the, in the Facebook account. I was coming back and forth, you know, every three months I was coming. I was living here for three months and then living in. Because his mom was here. Yeah, his mom by then. Yeah, you know, I, so I. So I, he's I, like, I, you're going to come to Vietnam, you're going to meet my mom. Build her house down to the I'm like, that's totally cool. He's like, hey, we're going to meet my dad for the first time. I went with him. Yeah. And we're sitting in the, I'll never forget, we're sitting in the uh, hotel. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm nervous. And he walks through the door, I'm like, that is so your dad, dude. Look at his face. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't even like a question. Yeah. I saw it because I'm really good at facial, you know, recognition. I, I compare people's faces and nose and the separation and blah blah blah. Was this the first time you met your, your dad? No, I actually oh. met him. I, I found him in January. Yeah, 90, 94. 94. Yeah, 94. 94. I was like, so. Yeah, but that was the yeah. first time uh, we, he actually we, met him we, before. But that's the first time I met him. Yeah. So I got to live vicariously through him. Would have been like how I feel if I met my parents. But yeah. then because of uh, sort of issues within the family, I didn't go back and see him for 10 years, because I was kind of angry at him. <laughs> Can we ask why, or that's not? Um, um, uh, I was uh, somewhere else in the Philippines, uh, and uh, uh, so we, uh, they knew they had found him and we were going to meet in Cape Town City, so when we met, it was very formal. I was wearing a Barong de Gaulag and blah, 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 and he had to prove to me that it was he was my father. Um, then we went around and met my sister, my two sisters, and my, my brother. He brought me to his house for the first time, and his first wife, who was older than him by 13 years, uh, they wanted her to meet me. And they brought me in the house, and they sat me in the living room, and she was in the back room. 
and she was just yelling and screaming, and yelling and screaming. My father went in there, my sisters went in there, my brother went in there to try to, and for me to sit there for two hours of this yelling and screaming, even though I didn't understand Tagalog or anything, was just too much. And so I left. I left. I just walked out of the house. It's tough to be, uh, you know, uh, referred to, you know, um, as the bastard child, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, and really getting punished for that. sort of humility because when I came over I thought you know America was the greatest and I was trying to change my mom and to do it the American way but then the fact of the matter is it wasn't the right way <laughs> and so we had to battle sometimes but in the long run she's she's the boss of the family whether my position or not and I found my mother you know the second husband had passed away my younger sister was five the house is falling over, and the, the money that I did give went ten times farther. And this is something that I could uh, help them with. I mean, I, you know, actions speak louder than words, and the only way that you're going to show action is by doing it. Thank you. We have four generations right here. The little one, the two little ones, are my niece's daughters. She's pregnant with her third child. And that's my sister's daughter. And then you have my mom. So that my mom is actually now a great grandmother. So you're looking at four generations right there. Đẻ con cũng dễ, mau lắm. Nhưng mà đẻ xong rồi mẹ bị bệnh luôn. Rồi về nhà rồi mình bị bệnh thì mình phải đi đi. Kì đó mẹ bị bệnh mẹ nuôi con được 7 ngày. 7 ngày xong mẹ không biết gì trơn mẹ không ăn cơm được, không bưng ăn cơm được, không ngồi được. Rồi lớp chị hai bệnh gần chết chị hai chứ nằm thêm thiếp thiếp nữa. Rồi mẹ nó thôi, mẹ nó thôi, mẹ nó ông ngoại thôi đem gửi con đi qua bệnh viện đi. Ô gửi qua bên con viện đi. Could you ask your mom about that um, first meeting when you saw each other after so many years? Coi đi dập đường có phải thiệt con tôi không? Nên mẹ qua mẹ thấy con ngồi ngồi chống tó. Mà mẹ thấy con chống tó mà mẹ mẹ nó ủa. Ta mà thôi về về về. Rồi lúc Hòa Bình á, Hòa Bình là ta nói là con con ai cho thì qua qua nhìn về nuôi. Không biết tèo trong cái cái là không biết là sanh ra là có liền, không không có à, sanh ra là có là thẹo liền, 
chứ không có không có không biết tại sao à. tại vì có thẹo rồi cũng như là à, ông trời ông làm thẹo sẵn cho mình để mình biết con mình sao lại thất lạc mình tìm mẹ nghĩ là con có tật nguyền mà con muốn về con tìm mẹ còn bao nhiêu người ở đây có nhiều người người ta mẹ kế bao rồi ta không nhìn nữa ta không nhìn nữa mà mẹ con mẹ mẹ nghĩ là đâu bao giờ gặp để con nữa con bên mỹ giờ con còn sống mẹ cũng đâu có tiền đâu đi tìm con mẹ biết đâu tìm nhưng mà con bây giờ cũng tìm mẹ thì cái là là ơn trên ban ơn cho mẹ lúc đó mẹ nghèo khổ quá không biết không làm lúa ra xong em đau em bệnh làm rồi trả nợ trên cái hỏi tiền lại ăn hỏi tiền lại xong cái mẹ nói chờ phải có ai cho mẹ chừng chịu bà trả nợ trường cái lúa rồi cho mấy đứa con ăn nhưng mà ai làm cho gì hay nó ai làm cho mẹ ai cũng nghèo chân ai làm cho sao tự nhiên con về con tìm mẹ con cho mẹ từ ngày đó tới giờ con giúp mẹ nên mẹ có ăn tới giờ chứ theo đúng ở việt nam là có tật gì là cha mẹ còn phải nuôi nữa chứ đâu có đâu có đâu làm đâu có tiền mà nhưng mà con có tiền cái gì cho mẹ thấy con rất là mừng mà con có tài mẹ gặp con là mẹ These are pictures right here from before I went out to the orphanage and then uh, this was uh, when I first came back in 91. I have a weird connection here. On the outside, I'm not Vietnamese. And on the inside, I'm not. It's kind of weird to think that. But the reality of it is, is that I am American. I was raised American. My thought beliefs are Western, not Eastern. And so I come back here, I give back, I work with the kids, do a lot of volunteer work, work with, work with orphanages. I love working with the kids. Because I, I look in their eyes, I'm like, that, that could have been me when I was that age. You know, and that, I could have been left behind and stayed there and had a different life. And, not even known about America. What do you work? Teach English. If I went back eight years ago for the first time and I had an address uh, of the orphanage I stayed at in Mung Tao, and I went back there and the building was vacant at the time, but and, 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 the, and the fortunate thing, the owner of the building had passed away five years prior to that, so I missed him. Um, now it's a, a way shop. They, they do bumble way and food and stuff like that. It's still standing there. It's only a few blocks from the ocean. Um, I took one of the pictures that I had, one of my baby pictures I had, and I went down, said a little prayer on the beach, and buried it in the sand. That was kind of my giving back, because ironically enough, back in the day, I would stand in California and look at the ocean, going, what it would be like to be on the other side, standing on the grounds, you know, in Vietnam. And I actually had to experience that, so that was pretty cool to be able to do that. I, if I put myself in her shoes when she was 30 years old, what she went through, what she had to do, I commend her. I mean, you know, to to just to give it up and walk away. You know, I mean, that's tough for any woman to give birth to her own child and walk away and, and hope for the best and to let her know. I mean, the only purpose for me to ever meet her today was to let her know that everything worked out. You can sleep well at night at ease knowing that, you know, I, I survived and I made it and I, I flourished and I succeeded in my goals, my dreams, and, you know, and you, did a good, you did the right thing. strong desire to go back to the U.S. and live, only unless, you know, a um, uh, family member uh, gets sick. I went back for quite a long time, for a few months anyway, when my mother got sick. So I would do that, I think, without hesitation. She fought cancer for quite a long time. Um, and, you know, when I, re when I heard that she was, you know, getting to a point where it probably wasn't, it wasn't going to turn for the better, then I, that's the end, no hesitation, and went back to help. She needed to be cleaned and bathed and all those things, you know, and she couldn't do it herself. She needed to be helped, you know, for feeding. So I helped her with, I helped with all those. Then I stayed home for three months. And that's where I, where I took care of mom most of that time. But then about one month before her death, I had to go back to work because my extended, my extended leave was, was up. 
so I needed to go back. So then about a, about a month later, she passed away. I don't miss her. I don't go see her grave when I'm home. It's nice to do, I know. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, but why? For me, I don't see a value, I don't see a purpose because she's dead, so she doesn't know I'm there or not. The thing is about being adopted, they say that you growing up, I mean, a lot of times having an attachment with somebody is really difficult because of the sort of traumatizing experience that we had as a child and that we lost. Okay, and then to be, become really close and really uh, commit to somebody uh, in that way uh, becomes much harder. I mean, I definitely, you know, in the past, uh, definitely, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much reserved on a lot of areas, but to give myself fully to something is really difficult. And it's just easier for me to just uh, not deal with it or run. Something that uh, a lot of adoptees deal with is that sort of sense of loss and in, in, in doing so. Separation anxiety. Yeah, I mean, in doing so to really commit in that way 100% is actually really difficult. And it, is it liberating when you do so? Like now you're about to get married. Um, Can you take down that wall? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, it's like a, a, to be able to get married, Actually, honestly, I didn't think I'd ever find anyone anymore. But to actually now uh, get married, it is kind of fulfilling a, a lifelong uh, dream. You know, I wanted to sort of come full circle. I wanted to use something to uh, bring, uh, you know, my three families together, you know, America, Philippines, and Vietnam. And this is what I'm doing in the wedding. Yeah, so. <laughs> He's tired of hearing it. <clears throat> yeah, I wonder if it has to do with maybe the idea of, you know, a commitment phobia or maybe a, you said separation anxiety where you fear that, you know, that, you know, you get separated again, all these things. I don't, you know, <clears throat> maybe, maybe that's why, you know, I've, it's, yeah, I've never really been too concerned with committing to, you know, in a long-term relationship with anyone. You know, I think there is a, a thing that we all have a, an unspoken connection with is that the separation anxiety, feeling alone, b being denied. Uh, we, we, I think we all suffer. May I almost be way, but we suffer from, you know, not being accepted. Um, and we have our, we've been, we've been raised to defend ourselves and protect ourselves, and we only go so far into relationships, and then we walk away, and we don't get too buried into because we're afraid they're not going to accept for who we are what we went through well i mean but that, that that's sort of one of the things that we've all struggled is being ostracized and in doing so we have our own shell you know what i'm saying i mean even in america we were teased or whatnot and even here in vietnam we're not even recognized as vietnamese i couldn't connect with anybody for years until i actually went to the reunion and met other adoptees and said wow we've all been on the same road and even there, I didn't get accepted because I didn't look Vietnamese. So on top of that, yeah, everybody thought you were like <laughs> I was somebody with somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so on top of not being accepted I was like, with the Vietnamese community, <laughs> I'm like, you're shitting me. The only one thing I was connected with is the feelings that we all experienced growing up as child, children, you know, in our, our adolescent years of of getting accepted, feeling connection. Like there was no blood. Every time I looked in the mirror, that, that was just me. I had no idea. I was I always dreamed about what it'd be like if I had my own child. What would that child look like? I had nothing to compare it to. I had no idea. I had no, you know, bloodline. I had no family tree to compare it to. It was it was it was rolling the dice. Even my my ex-wife. I, I only went in so deep with her. Do you know what I'm saying? An emotional connection with her. Um, she knew my background. She was very supportive and understanding. But there was a part of me saying that I don't think I can live my rest of my life in Ohio. Uh, I think. So I had I had the same feeling. I mean, yeah. my, but my dad always. Scared me not to come. Scared me into not wanting not to come back. Because yeah. like, like, Vietnam's a communist country, right. and you know, there if you say anything wrong, you do anything wrong, they could put you in jail forever. And so it took me a very long time to come out here. I really uh, thought a lot about the thing you told. That you really hate the fact when people adopt because uh, they want to save or something like that. And you said that what what you liked or what you wanted to is like. You want children, and this is why you adopt, and not because you want to save. What do you guys think about this? Mine was a tax break. 
The tax break, nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what no, I, when I heard your, your story, that's what I was thinking of. It sounds like there's six of us. They're like adopting. not adopting because they want to have children. They're adopting to maybe you know, maybe you know, show other people that they're you know that they're generous and kind and or. No, we we're very we we're very uh, protected, quiet family. Uh, my father was very controlling. So growing up, it was like yeah, we knew the neighbors and this and that, but they didn't know much of our business. Very protected, controlling life growing up. And we always had kind of a sarcastic running joke amongst our siblings that we were just tax breaks. You know, you get so many, you get this tax deduction, you get this, you get that, you know what I mean? The fact that you all moved back to Vietnam, do you think that's in any, any little way, like, uh, I don't want to use a, a strong word, but like kind of a failure type of thing for your families who adopted you? When I asked her, I said, are you not disappointed about me coming back? Uh -huh. No, I don't want you to ever think you're a failure. You gave me a life, you raised me to be the best man I could possibly be. And I have nothing but love for that. Me going back to Vietnam is for me. And selfishly enough, that is only for me. You know, I'll come back to see you. I'll come. We had a conversation about this. And she's totally supported me. She's like, I know you gotta do what you gotta do. You've always been that kind of guy that just does what he needs to be doing. You know what I mean? If you feel it's right, it's in your heart, I support you. Even if we find our family, like my mom, my uh, mother here in Vietnam, <laughs> I am my mother's son from America. My values are still there. My memories of growing up are because of what she taught me, not because of what my mom here in Vietnam taught me. This is a birth thing. You know what I'm saying? But I do appreciate the fact that uh, she did, but now we're living together and I'm trying to learn about the culture and what it means to be a Vietnamese son. But the fact of the matter is my mother and my father in America, when I told them, were just happy. And you're emotionally closer to her or to her? <laughs> well, now, I, uh, I mean, they, 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 it's different. You, can't, you yeah. can't compare them. I mean, this is two different worlds and two different values. You can't compare them? No, I, mean, I don't think so. Because, just because, in, inside. Like, no, but I mean, the thing is, I love my mom in America for certain reasons, and, and those are American reasons. You know, I love my mom here in Vietnam because of our Vietnamese reasons. Sometimes those those reasons do clash. And I'm still sort of walking the fine line between the two different countries, and I always will. You know, and to, to put more weight on one or the other is not fair. You know, like growing up with my, uh, with my American mom, you know, I definitely have that sort of uh, uh, feeling that I'm always going to be the child. I'm not afraid of being yelled at by my mom here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Whereas yeah, in America, right. you know, when she says something, you know, blah, 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 I have that natural feeling yeah. from a child of like, oh, oh shit. Right. You know, whereas with my mom here, even if she says, it's more of a conversation. Growing up in, in America and having a, such a diverse family, you know, I mean, five of us were adopted. We had uh, two from Vietnam, two from India, and uh, one that was out for Swedish. You grow up and you've experienced all this stuff. You were all punished at the same time. You all had fun at the same time and whatnot. So those are your brothers and sisters. Don't want to go. This is my home now. You know, this is how I look at it. Vietnam is my home. I do, at some point. Why not? You're going to have a Maybe. Never know. You never know what to expect. If you'd asked me um, five years ago when I lived in Vietnam, I said, no, you're crazy. So you just never know. Never say never. The my come partly to my philosophy in life is that everything is borrowed. We don't own anything. We don't own relationships. We don't own things. We don't own, you know, even our memories or whatever. Those are just borrowed and we have to give them back sometimes. So that's why maybe I don't have that strong connection that, well, maybe it's time to give it back. I was able to have that experience. I was able to, you know, get to go out there and see the side and have some emotional connection with that. But maybe it's time, time to give it up.
Az On The Spot technikai partnere a 220 volt webáruház. A műsort a DM Drogiri Mart támogatja. Unikum. Csak pozitívan. Az On The Spot stábjának munkáját a Szerencsejáték ZRT támogatja. On the end of the, of the tunnel, I was happy that I see my dad. After two months, I was just jumping. I was so happy. Egy város alig több mint 300 kilométerre Magyarországtól. A modernkori történelem leghosszabb ideig tartó ostroma. Tízezer halott, sok tízezer sebesült, és egy generáció, amely elveszítette a gyerekkorát. I saw a man carrying his arm. I will never, never, never forget it. His arm wasn't a part of his body. It wasn't connected to his body. He was carrying it running across the up, up, up hill. Jack Esther és Estakács András olyan emberekkel forgatott Bosnia-Hercegovinában, akik a Sarajevói ostrom alatt voltak gyerekek. Mi maradt a háború okozta traumákból húsz évvel később? In the everyday life, we're, we're not talking about war ever. When we talk about war, we joke about it. We're very brutal to ourselves also, because there is some certain kind of pride where you don't want to accept yourself as a victim. On the spot, az ellenség gyermekei, Sarajevo. Jövő szerdán a Dunán.